I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. We have a special guest today, and our good friend the judge is joining us. So, Tom, I'm going to have you introduce Alan and uh, kick things off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Alan, you and I spoke uh, about three weeks ago before you went on vacation, and uh, you had some, uh, as I recall, I think you had two encounters with, uh, with the topic at hand. Um, so two, what I'm going to do two, two incidents. I don't, you know, I, I can't prove that they were encounters or not. So I mean, two, two circumstances that were very interesting. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, I understand. It's, it's kind of difficult if you don't actually see one. So I'll tell you what, I'm just going to hand it over to you and, uh, fill us in and give us the details. And then, uh, periodically, uh, one of us may, um, you know, we may jump in with a question. Okay, very good. Well, I'm a, I'm a, probably like a lot of people who are into the topic that are my age, uh, middle-aged, is uh, we were motivated by Boggy Creek. You know, that sort of introduced a, tre- a tremendous amount of us to the drive in, at the drive-in. But something happened before that for me was uh, the Lake Work Monster. Um, which is right where we lived uh, when I was a kid. And uh, that just really tore up the media for locally. I know now it's ancient ancient Bigfoot history. But at the time, I mean, it was hot news, and there's actually a fairly decent photograph, decent considering the subject, uh, of, uh, of, of a white squatch uh, taken there at the, uh, at, outside of Lake Worth. Um, so that kind of introduced me to it, that there was this giant hairy thing running around in the swamps. Where would this be located? That was at the Fort Worth Nature Center, which is uh, near Lake Worth, Texas. It's called the Lake okay. Worth Monster. Thank Fort you. Worth Nature Center is still there, and uh, it's just a outdoor natural resources area. Gotcha. And... Uh, and my friend's parents would take us over there looking. I didn't know. I was just a kid, you know, going out there looking for the Lake Worth monster because that was kind of a thing you did. And we never came across it. Uh, but uh, I still, certainly remember doing that. And that was really my first introduction into there's this, there's something out there. I don't know what it is, but it sounds pretty darn scary uh, if, you're, if you're a little kid. And I guess if you're an adult, too. And then uh, you've got Boggy Creek and all those movies that had all the docudramas of the 70s, you know, the ones with Peter Graves and all those kinds of things. And I remember seeing Patty on one of them, and it just, I, I thought, even as a kid, I thought, that's not a guy in a suit. Hey, Alan, I want to, I'm going to jump in for a second. You caught my attention. You talk about, a, an incident called the Lake Worth Monster, and I'm only, I mean, just very vaguely familiar with it on the periphery. Can you maybe go into, um, <clears throat> you said it was, it sounded like it was quite a media event back then. Maybe kind of just fill us in a bit on what that was about. There, certainly, it was a uh, large, white, I mean, we would say large, white squash today, not large, but and all of them are large, that, you know, the full adult uh, squatch uh, that uh, I believe at one time as, as, as many as a half dozen or so, maybe a full dozen, saw it uh, um, after it started making appearances in the Fort Worth Nature Center. And I'm, I was just a kid, and I really haven't picked up anything on it in years. 
Uh, but it, it, uh, if you Google Lake Worth Monster, you'll get a ton of information. Uh, and it would just uh, be cited. And at one point, um, apparently when there was a crowd of people out there, and Paul saw it at the same time, he threw uh, a tire. Not the rubber portion of the tire, but the tire inside. Uh, just throwing it like a Frisbee at him, uh, at the crowd. And uh, didn't hit anybody or anything like that. But it was, you know, rock throwing, throwing something. Um, and uh, then there's a, actually, a, a, like I said, a decent photograph, given the subject and given the era, of, uh, of the Lake Worth monster, so-called. And it got transferred into Goatman and Frogman and all kinds of, you know, everybody started strap hanging their, their, their special needs monsters onto this poor, <laughs> this poor creature. And, and so it's ended up in a lot of different discourses, but it's about a, uh, you know, a very, very large bipedal, hairy something. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I'm looking at a picture of it right now. And I, I'm fascinated yeah, because, good. yeah, it um, says the Lake Worth Monster. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to find the, the URL for it. Maybe I can post it on our webpage. But. You know, I picked up a tire and threw it like a frisbee. From sort of the left rear of the animal. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the famous picture. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, that's interesting. You know what I really like about that is the fact that the media had a real different approach and treatment of the subject uh, back then. That they treated it with. Uh, as a serious topic as opposed to silly set tabloid uh, stuff like they do now. Oh, yeah, where you get the eye roll and, the, you know, the kind of silly face they make right before they announce the story and all that. Right. Yeah, and I've actually seen some news media in, I think it was in Colorado, where somebody had, for all intents and purposes, I thought a very credible sighting. And, yep, you're right. Either the eye roll, and uh, they're not going to, I don't know how to really phrase it, they're, they're just not going to really hang their hat on that. They're, they're going to uh, distance themselves, keep it at arm's length. Certainly. I, they're, they're, and they're certainly not going to investigate it further. So, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to take it on as a serious, hey, these people saw something, let me go out here and see what they might have seen, rather than, make my little faces at the camera yeah so anyway I, I didn't mean to interrupt you i just uh i, I just found that very interesting it is it, it, all the sort of i was i you know we went out there looking for it uh from time to time and things like that i have no contact with the animal whatsoever it's just that that's an early memory i mean that's right there with moon landing for me and, and, I, and I think at about the same time 68 69 somewhere in there 70 maybe i don't uh, so, like I remember the moon landing, I also remember this, and uh, and I think there would occasionally be a sighting from time to time pop back up over there. But I don't know. I I don't know. I, I just don't remember. There's a there's a book written by the uh, actually a, a, a not a terrible book written by uh, one of the first journalists to cover the story, um, and has a lot of the accounts in there and things like that, but at certain points she decided to fictionalize some of it, and that's where it, it was. Uh, but uh, uh, it is uh, it is in the Texas uh, lexicon of monster names. Uh, yeah. And then in the 70s, in the seventies, we we were all barraged with the Peter Graves documentaries and you know things like that. Uh, that would they would come sort of docudramas. That's where I saw Patty at some point and determined that's a real. Whatever it is, that's real. Uh, I don't know what that is, but that's not a man in a suit. That's an animal. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And also, um, you know, it's it's uh, you know, besides just the uh, the serious treatment of the topic, some of those shows that you just mentioned, I thought were actually some of them were for really interesting, especially for the times, because there wasn't a lot of information on this uh, on this topic and that's kind of where you had to go yeah it was interesting how you, they would have peter graves walk up like it was a crime scene you know and they have all these people out there <laughs> uh, you know putting plaster in and it was you know taped off and police and 
you know, for the for the little setups. But uh, yeah, it was. I mean, they're da- they're very dated, but uh, there's a lot of good details, and there's a lot of accounts, and uh, they actually dressed up a monster a lot better than they did in more recent series. Um, and uh, you know, and I think kept the mystery and the and the fear there a little bit too. Well, that's exactly right. And Texas has actually has a long history of these creatures. Yeah, we do. I'm here in West Texas, and we talked about some of the some of the West Texas sightings earlier. But of course, the you know Boggy Creek being the closest and most famous of the sites, and that sort of, sort of straddles both sides of the uh, of, of the state line right there. That you've got, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, I thought that there was just one, and he lived in the Pacific Northwest because I didn't understand biology or anything. You know, I didn't know they couldn't live 100 years or 150 years or anything like that. So I just assumed when I would watch Boggy Creek, for example, that that was a different kind of monster entirely. You know, it wasn't until much later in my, my childhood, you know, when I was reading John Green in the library and, uh, you know, some of the other uh, non nonfiction books that I would manage to get my hand on in uh, sometimes bookless West Texas, it was a, uh, you know, that's where, I, wow, there's a lot of these. You know, this isn't one one thing making its way, <laughs> zigzagging all over the nation. And so uh, there, I'm glad to hear you say that because I, you know, for, for years that's what I thought as well. Oh, there's one of these things. <clears throat> I guess the uh, North America has its own single, you know, abominable snowman. Well, it's 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 abominable snowmen, and there's a lot of them. Yeah, we yeah, get a lot of reports out of Texas. Uh, I think um, the big thicket is one of them. Oh yeah. So continue on. You uh, tell us a little about a little bit about the um, like uh, we'll call them experiences <laughs> that you had. Well, I think one of them uh, you were hunting or camping. And I don't want to make any claims as to what they were. They were certainly interesting. Um, and uh, uh, one of them at least very frightful. But you said the big thicket, and it's important for people not in Texas to realize the big thicket is a geographic region of Texas. Now, there's a national forest uh, called the big thicket. Well, that's actually just a small part of the big thicket. The big thicket okay. is really all, all of northeast Texas. That whole, I mean, from Huntsville, I know that doesn't mean anything, but uh, uh, north of Houston up. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that that's a geographic. It's like the Rio Grande Valley. We call it the Valley. East Texas is the big thicket. That's just the name for that whole region. I live on the out in the Llano Estacado Staked Plains. So that's just a regional name. And people come from out of Texas and they're looking at that part, that one forest, and they're thinking it's right in here. And it's, well, it certainly could be, but it's actually a much geogra- much larger geographic area as a Texan. And the uh, you know, all that stuff gets pushed to the side as you grow older sometimes, and and uh, not not having a a childhood experience like Will did make you a believer right away. Uh, you know, things, boys, cars, girls, sports, all that stuff. You know, just sort of comes into play, and you 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 know you you're hanging out with your friends, and you're talking about girls, and you're want a new car. I mean, those kind of things are uh, just the way it is. And so kind of got off that, and I really, in high school, got very rural. Um, I was hunting constantly. Uh, if I wasn't hunting, I was camping. If I wasn't camping, I was probably reading a book or something like that. So just just an enormous amount of uh, activity uh, within the forest line, and that's probably what led me to go in, in, into a military career because I like that. I like being out in the woods, and I like all of that that went with it. Um, but it, I, we were in high school. Me and uh, uh, still my best friend today, and he's retired Marine Corps. Uh, I went one way, he went another, and uh, we we're out on his, uh, his his property, uh, quite a ways away from where we both lived. And it wasn't a deer lease; it was just a cattle lease. And uh, we would go. Uh, it was on the Brazos. I'll, I'll say that. And uh, on this place on the Brazos, we would go, and we kind of had one spot we'd always go back to. And we probably did it three, you know, three times every six months, maybe four, uh, depending on the weather and things like that. It was mostly a fair weather exercise. So we would go out there and, you know, just do the camping thing, take our weapons, and 
and uh, just do that sort of stuff. Just uh, uh, same thing I did in the military, run around in the woods, you know, with guns. So uh, that, that attracted me at an early age. Anyway, the, we're at this one particular place, and it's a dog leg in the Brazos. Um, and the Brazos is very low at this point, and you can just basically walk across it in several places. It's just standing water. It hadn't rained in a while. So uh, there, there's, there's, uh, we're not in any danger or flood, but we're in a, we're in a dog leg section. And uh, I hadn't thought about probably Bigfoot, Sask, nothing in years, nothing. It had, it had you know, I, I could probably speak intelligently on it, but I wasn't uh, into it. And it would have been very hard at that time to be into something like that because there's no computer, there's only a few books, and, you know, and you tend to think you're the only person that's interested in this sort of thing, um, especially when you're isolated by geography. But it was, it was... I don't know, probably midnight, getting close to midnight, and um, started hearing, I'm going to call them knocks, but then let me explain what I heard. What we would describe today as knocks, and it's in, in a pattern of freeze. Bump, 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 bump. And, but it's metallic. I'm thinking for the first hour that's going on, I'm thinking it's just a pump jack behind us someplace. And those are those grasshopper looking ore field things that pump the, pump the gas out of the ground, pump the oil out of the ground. I don't, they're, they're all over the place here. I don't know how common they are where y'all are. But uh, it's called a pump jack. just looks like a grasshopper standing there drinking or, uh, you know, drinking in the oil up and down, up and down, up and down all the time. And I'm thinking it's a pump jack. Just we're hearing that kind of off in the ways, but it's fairly close. It's probably, once you got up above the bluff, above the flood line of the Brazos right there, I'd say it's probably 20 meters, maybe maybe a little more. Hard to say because it's working its way through us through a ton of mesquite. Tom, as we discussed, mesquite is a, is a weed. It's not a tree. Um, it, is, it is a pestilence here. Um, and uh, though it does cook good, it does, I'll give it that. It does, it cooks excellent, but it's just like walls of undergrowth. It's like a it's like a a new growth forest where you've just got that complete wall of undergrowth. Well, that stays here all year round from mesquites, unless there's a fire or something like that. But and they're just they're everywhere. You have to clear your property. I don't have a huge place, and I and it's it's a problem here. They just come right back up all the time. Uh, anyway, so Colonel were were these um, knocks being answered by perhaps another creature? Were you hearing these on either side of you, or was it coming from just one location? Coming from one location, which would be behind us, up above the, the flood line, uh, and probably back in, through the mesquite, maybe 20 meters or so. Um, and it was... Uh, so it, it would, it would, and I'm, I'm saying, or so, because it's difficult to get that exact distance on, uh, with all the mesquite and undergrowth that's in our way. But no, I don't think it's, I don't think, I never heard anything anyway. I just heard the one. Bump, bump, bump. And like I said, for the first little while, I'm, I just think it's pump jack, and then I say something about that pump jack sure annoying or something, something like that. And uh, my friend says, uh, there's no pump jacks out here. And in hindsight, you know, I've, I've started thinking, you know, in this conversation between he and I was years ago when we were catching up on it and he was refreshing me and I was talking, talking to him about it and everything. What's not there is any pump jacks anywhere near this. There were no pump jacks anywhere near us on that entire lease. Uh, what there are in every Texas field are corner posts. They're everywhere. You can't step over a tree in Texas without running into an old barbed wire fence and a corner post someplace. They're just, they're just because people take down the barbed wire, they just let the barbed wire fall down, rot away with the wood, or the wood rots away, wire falls down, and the, the, you know, the uh, fence corners stay up, and they're metallic, they're metal, they're iron. So it occurred to me that whatever's wrapping on this, knocking, is doing it on a metal on an iron corner post 
that's the metallic noise I'm hearing. Um, again, I'm not seeing what's making this noise. I'm only hearing it. But there is no humanity out there anywhere around us. It would be very odd for someone to do that anyway. Uh, and there's no oil field equipment anywhere around us that would make that noise. Um, but there are, there are corner posts everywhere. I mean, old property lines and everything else. They're just all over the place. Um, so what it was doing was it was, because there's mesquites aren't trees, they're weeds, they can't be wrapped on. There's nothing really, I mean, it's just like a big bush, basically. Uh, there are, uh, you're going to have scrub oak and some, uh, and some live oaks around uh, water, uh, but uh, there was nothing that big, nothing big enough to make any kind of sound like that. What did it sound like? It did it sound like it was being struck by another metal object, another metal no, heads both? No, just hearing one metal to it. I'm not hearing a double clang or anything like that. Okay. So if you had an axe handle and you were out beating on a corner post, gotcha. Rather, as opposed to if if, if you had a hammer and we're beating on a corner post, because you'd have that ring. Um, sure. And all I'm hearing is the, 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 the iron sound, uh, the metallic sound of it, and just once, not twice with a hammer or, or anything else would be hitting it. So it's, it's um, anyway, so there's that. And we're, you know, and I remember we talked about that for a little while, and then you know, we're teenage boys, so something else comes up, you know, uh, that, that you just, jump onto when we were teenage boys and down the downstream from us and it's downstream it's like i said the brazos was pretty dry at this time of year very dry um not long after that i hear barking i start here barking now it's not uncommon in rural areas for dogs to pack up at night uh, country dogs that run loose form their own little army and run around at night chasing rabbits and everything else. The, the thing is, those all sound different. I mean, if you've got, let's say, 10, 15 dogs, uh, rural dogs, you're going to get 10 or 15 different voices. I mean, one of them's going to be a German Shepherd, one of them's going to be a Mutt, one of them's going to be, you know, and they're not going to sound exactly the same. And what I was hearing was a uniform bark. And I'm using bark because I don't know what else to say. Um, but there was a lot of it. And so I picked up my HK-91, uh, put a round in the chamber, and um, walked, started walking that way. And my uh, friend just stayed there at the camp, and I was just going to go check it out because I, I didn't know. And I know it wasn't coyotes. It certainly wasn't foxes. Um, because all those have those are extremely easy to tell. But something was a lot of things were barking down the river from us, and it's probably eh, 100 meters, 150 meters down, and it's right in front of me on 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 the left side of me um, as I'm walking downstream. So it's on my left, off my left shoulder, in all that scrub is where all this barking is going on. And it's right there, but I can't see anything. I mean, it is right on the lip of the, of the uh, flood line there. And it dog the river dog legs again here. And I don't want to send everybody through all these dog legs, but the river dog legs again at this point. And I can't catch up with them. They, again, very uniform noises, uh, a lot of them. Um, but they keep moving ahead of me, just ahead of me, just a bit. I move forward, and they move forward, and I heard nothing breaking, not the traditional, you know, sounded like a tractor trailer pulling through the brush kind of noises. No, nothing. Heard nothing. Um, just a lot of barking. Uh, and the only thing I could, you know, I, I, I heard something, uh, one time, just looking through videos, trying to find a match for it, trying to find a reason why it wasn't a Sasquatch or anything like that. And I came across chimps, and they were barking. 
uh, what we would again I'm using the word bark I don't know what word to call it um, but it's I'd move a few meters forward and so would it so would this group of barkers did it sound like it was multiple let's call it voices or or just one creature repeating itself no it was several different animals um, okay uh, and it was it was staccato and clipped. It wasn't the bark of a dog, which you know, ar, 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 that kind of. It wasn't, you know, it was almost like you're saying bark, bark. Very clipped, um, and right in front of me. I couldn't, ca but I couldn't catch up with them. They were not in front of me, but up to my left and in front of me, up on the up on the bank, in the thicket, in the mesquite. Hey Colonel, was it was it moving as you're? Did it feel like it's drawing you away or drawing you into it? It was certainly moving ahead of me. What motives it had, I cannot say, but it was certainly kept at a pace where it was staying just ahead of me, just forward of yeah. my left shoulder. Yeah, that's not dogs. That's definitely not dogs. Um. So, you know, I tried to, I, I again, tried to find some, but it, it, the, the, the one video I saw that said, had chimps barking or apes bark or monkeys bark, I don't know, something like that. But, and again, I hesitate to use that word because that brings up dogs, but it wasn't dogs. It wasn't coyotes. It wasn't foxes. It was no, it, 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 let me rule out all canids. <laughs> you know, Alan, I was point. jumping real quick. I, I was just going to mention the same thing. Uh, I was doing some reading about gorillas the other day, and them, along with some other higher primates do make a barking sound or what we would call a barking sound yeah this is going to sound stupid so bear with me have y'all ever seen Greystoke Lord of the Apes yes it's probably the greatest Tarzan movie ever made it was excellent and the actor that's also in Highlander I can't remember his name off the top of my head and it's not important but when he's communicating he made a very similar noise when he's because all he speaks is gorilla <laughs> at the, or chimpanzee rather at the first of the movie um so and he did a, the actor did a tremendous amount of work training uh with, with apes and copying their movement and everything else um but the, the the sounds he would make were probably the closest i can I, I won't say that's it but it was very close but it was a clipped one tone uh, quick sound. We've heard multiple instances where these things have uh, mimicked owls and have whistled and even far-reaching stories where they mimic a call to a dog or something of that nature. Uh, would you be led to conclude that they were trying to mimic? It sounded like they were mimicking a dog. Um, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but... Uh, is that the feeling you get now? I can't say. Uh, that's a good point. I've never really thought about it like that. Um, I've always thought that they were better ventriloquists than that. Um, you know that they they could make a dog they could make a dog sound that sounded more like a dog than what these were doing because these were making no attempt. This was almost communicative in nature. I see. Uh, um, so if I I certainly didn't hear any whistles. Uh, if there were any owl noises, I did not pay them any any attention at all in where I was at because that would have been very common nighttime noise. Uh, yeah, I'm going to jump in um, for just a moment. I, I want to say that I want to just reiterate everything that Tony just said is exactly – I mean, he took the words out of my mouth. Um, number one, the monotone nature of the sounds is uh, – I've heard it with owls. And it sounded like a you know your typical 800 pound owl, which is you know of course not typical. And but it's a it's a very monotone and it's kind of annoying. It has a little bit of a um, agitated kind of an annoying sound to it. And so mimicking is the word that came to mind. Hey Tom, here's my thought. In some of these cases, they do mimic. In this type of case, and I've heard this numerous times, I, I don't think that's a mimic. That bark type noise—that's that's something entirely different. 
But do you think it's these creatures? It is. It, it goes along with grunts and things like that, but it's not It's not one of the mimicking behaviors. Okay, very good. I think it's just their noise um, and them talking to each other. Whatever it was, whatever they were doing, it, was, it didn't sound like an owl. It, when I, I mean, I've got owls all around me in the evening here. And, and again, I, would have, I wouldn't have paid any attention to an owl at, at all. Uh, whistle might have gotten my attention, but I did not hear any whistles that I can recall. It was, we went from the thumping, and I have no memory whether the thumping continued during this process or not. I just remember it started, that started it, and, you know, and after a little while I said something about the, the, oper- the, op- the machine, and, oh, there's no machine out here. <laughs> what is that then? And, you know, now thumping, knocking, these are common topics for us. But this is, you know, 1970s. So uh, I don't know if anybody cracked those codes yet, or very much so anyway. Uh, and then, Will, you were around the Four Horsemen, so you were probably in tune with that kind of detail and data, but, you know, I wasn't. So I didn't, I didn't you know, just why is this not what going on? Why is there, why is there this noise? And then why is this, this other noise coming from down, down the river? I think your point, Tom, about it being about being led. Um, I don't know. I can't speak for whatever was making that noise, but I, I can say whatever they were doing was working because I was doing that. I mean, I, that was they had a carrot on a stick for me. I was just a natural curiosity, and I had uh, you know seven six two with thirty rounds. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, was, you know, uh, and and the reason I mentioned being led or kind of a, uh, like you said, a carrot on a stick is a very good analogy. We've heard that time and again. And uh, one of the guys that's been on the show in the past, Lee has talked about in an area where he heard laughing. He said, it sounded like a, like maybe a young teenage girl laughing and it's at nighttime. So he's, he walks out there and that's a little bit further, walks out a little bit further, walks out. Um, Will, do you remember, uh, him talking about that. Yeah, I do recall that. Yeah, I, I don't remember all the details at the moment, but he did talk about that a couple of times, actually. Yeah, and and the the thought that came to mind was um, drawing somebody in. You know, it's it's leading them in. Well, I remember the baby cry uh, being used during the Plains Indian Wars. There was a process where a baby would be taken from a house and uh, seriously injured in a tree line. Of course, the mother is going to hear that and, gonna, you know, everything's going to stop to go out and retrieve the child. Uh, that wasn't super common, but it did happen. And uh, so I would suggest this is, you know, similar, a similar tactic um, done in a more, you know, more primitive way. But I don't know. It was just, um, but anyway, at some point, I just said, I'm too far away. I'm too far away from my, my buddy. This is not right. It just, it just started alarm bells, whistles, whatever you want to call it. You know, I had a, I had a road to Damascus moment. <laughs> said, this is not where you need to be right now. And so I backed all the way back around the dog legs, came back up the river. And what I'd heard, we kind of discussed it. And then for the first time and the only time in my life, we went back to the house. Never done that before. I haven't done it in rain. I haven't done it in uh, – probably, you probably talked me into it if it started snowing. But uh, um, no, uh, I, I couldn't have – I just couldn't have ever imagined unless somebody got desperately hurt ever going back to the house. You know, that was just uh, – Why, why did you guys – what what was the reason for the decision? Was it just a sense of – Unease, uh, something not right. Well, something was behind us making those those noises, or had been, and something was downstream or downriver making other noises. Now I'm not sure. I can't remember at the time if we put them together, but just it was getting weird for me. Yeah. And, and we both had we we had I had a Colt 1911 on. I mean, I was we, we were ready for the Alamo to happen, but. <laughs> um, it just we were they were on two sides of us. Whatever they is. When you when you got separated 
and this thing was baiting you, if that's what it was, how far were, how far do you think you got away separated from your friend? Well, I lost vision on him at a probably 100 meters or so because the river hooked at that point and went into another dog leg. So I probably went down another 150 meters, so maybe 250, 300 meters total away from him. You know, but the entire time I'm walking, going, what the heck is this noise? What is going on over here? Because it's loud. It is, it's, it's a cacophony right there in the tree line right above me or in the brush line right above me, and I can't get to it, and it's driving me nuts. Um, and it's at that point something went off. I don't know if it's, you know, the, the sense or uh, something wasn't right. You know, when they're bluff charging, they seem to make a lot of noise and sounds. Um, you know, and they throw rocks at you and they do things like that as a, as a bluff to get you to move. You know, that's that's maybe we're, maybe we're stepping up on their version of violence to a certain extent. But, you know, none of that was going on. This was just these barking noises, a lot of them, and I couldn't get close to them, not close enough to inspect, which is what I kept trying to do. Every time I'd take a you know, move, they would, that little crowd of whatever it was would move as well. Anyway, I uh, went back. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's interesting because there is no, that's not a tactic or strategy of any, no North American animal it just doesn't happen, right? I mean, you you would probably agree with that. Certainly, none in West Texas. I can't I can't say familiarity with all, all North American mammals. Okay, <laughs> that's nothing I know of in West Texas that's going to behave like that. Either either way, what kind of animal? I mean, one animal is going to have to have hands that's going to go up there and rail on a corner post. Exactly. Right. Something, to, you know, we're not going to, we don't have any bears or this far out. I mean, there's bears in Texas, but not, not here, um, not in this region. And uh, so it just, but I wasn't going that way. I, I, I wasn't thinking, well, this is a mysterious moment in my life. You know, this is a mystery animal here. I wasn't thinking that at all. I just started on, it's time to leave. I mean, just time to leave. So backed up all the way back. Uh, making sure I, you know, had my weapon oriented in that vicinity and uh, kept backing up, backing up, made it to Russell, and we talked about it, and time to move out. Maybe foreboding was a better word. Okay, all right, sure. Or, or, or feeling threatened. I mean, I, I generally remember feeling apprehension and, and um, I don't want to use the word fear because I don't think we were there yet, But uh, and, and I'm not saying I haven't been there, but... Uh, um, I just time to move. Time to move out. So we gathered up, and we didn't have anything. We camped open air and just, you know, a couple of ground cloths and you know, kicked out the fire. And right before we went up into the uh, up onto the top of the of the uh, river bank, which was probably a good mm, nine ten feet above us. Um, and I took my HK and I just did a reconnaissance by fire into the into the mesquite. <laughs> okay, I, I think I've heard Will. I may have heard Will talk uh, mention that tactic in the past. I, I've heard it somewhere well, Will, before. Will, Will was a cavalry trooper. He knows what a recon by fire. I, I was just going to so. say a little recon by fire. <laughs> yep. It did. It, 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 um, you can solve a lot of problems with the reconnaissance by fire. That's right. If you're not um, sure, just, so I just take a pot shot in it. <laughs> yeah. So I just opened up with the HK-91 and everything we had just into the, just to clear a route for us through the mesquite. Because uh, I didn't know what was – I couldn't see. You, you just couldn't it's, – it's so thick in those areas, you cannot see um, what's in it. You don't know that Jack the Ripper's standing there or anything. You just don't know. And uh, so we got out, got in the truck, and uh, drove to the farmhouse uh, about 20 miles, and that's it. That's the first one. What, did you get any response from firing into the brush? None that I recall. Did it shut them up? I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. I wish I could. I, I uh, At a certain point, it started... 
we focused on the situation, which was to get out of here, and I wasn't listening to anything. You know, I just... As you backed up, did they then start following you? They did not follow me past the uh, the second uh, uh, dog leg. They did. They stopped where they had started when I first heard it. I had it on. I could show you on a map. But, uh, it, they, they when I first heard them and said, "I wonder what that noise is," and walked down the river uh, to begin with. That's about as far as they got to us. So they were, you know, a good 150 meters away or so. They never, whatever they is, it never closed on us. Or, but you know, I, 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 again, when we started evacuating, it was evacuate. You know, I wasn't paying attention to anything other than that, than the topic at hand. And um, so, I, you know, I've never heard. Maybe some of you gentlemen have. Have you ever heard a coyote bark? I've heard them yip, howl. Do they bark? I've heard coyotes make every noise imaginable, and there'll probably be some on on my property here in a couple of hours. But uh, uh, this was definitely, like I said, this there was no canid noise uh -huh. uh, um, at, at all uh, going on here. Because I've, I've look, I've exhausted myself trying to think that was just coyotes, or that was just because I think we need to do that with this topic. Is the first thing we need to do is prove that it's false. Yeah, start eliminating things. You yeah, don't have uh, wolves. Do you have red wolves down there? We do have red wolves. Um, they're they're very uh, they're in amongst coyotes quite a bit. They're not a full breed anymore. Uh, you got the Mexican wolf and you've got the red wolf. A Mexican wolf's going to be further to my south, uh, down south of San Antonio in that vicinity, generally, uh, out to the Gulf and down into the valley, and then in northern Mexico. And out, you know, all over Texas, you're going to have the red wolf. But the problem is, they're so they're 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 basically red coyotes. The red wolf, and that was my understanding, is the red wolf is actually it's really small. It's a, it's almost like a just sort of like a larger coyote, except it actually is part of the wolf family. It's a bigger, redder coyote. Um, at least the ones I've seen. And uh, I think the uh, Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife is trying to breed, um, you know, get get the coyote blood out and, and recreate the breed over generations. I think that that is a project that's ongoing, um, but I, I can't speak to it. I've just heard that. I don't know that that's correct. But it, it um, you know, the only time I saw one was in a zoo. Uh, in uh, Victoria, Texas, which used to have a fantastic yeah. zoo called all, all Native Animals of Texas. And that's the only time I've ever seen one on the hoof. And okay. You'd have had to pay me to tell me it wasn't coyote. I mean, I just red tinted coyote to me. So, no, no, Judge, I don't think it was a – I don't know. I, 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 I'm sure someone could Google that up and listen to what a red wolf uh, sounds like, but – Again, this had no canid sound to it. Gotcha. Um, and but I'm also hesitant to I, I'm hesitant to use the word bark because I don't. It wasn't that noise. It wasn't the barking. I just don't know what else to call it. Um, it was just loud, and there were several. I've heard these creatures make, for the lack of a better word, it was a scream bark. Uh, I talked about this with one of our past guests, I just talked to him on the phone the other day, a guy named Dalton. He lives here in Oregon, and he said that was, he was, uh, uh, he said it's one of the most common noises besides the whistle. It was this, like, a two-second, I don't think it's what you heard, but they make a kind of a, arr, arr, um, that's, you know. That's, that's pretty a, good. Uh, there you go. All right. I, uh, <laughs> I'm hired. Uh, but that's a common noise. Uh, that, sound that uh, they make, that, and I, that's not bad. That's pretty close. I mean, that's as close as anything I've ever heard. Yeah, and I, I just call it a scream bark or a chuff or something. I've heard it at you know, like two in the morning, and uh, you know, out camping. Picture a cacophony of those going on. Yeah, that would get your undivided attention. Maybe maybe thirty yards from, you, but you cannot see because of the the foliage. Yeah, yeah, that's that's disconcerting. It really is. 
it's odd. It's 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 not what you would normally hear. That uh, that get me backtracking in a hurry. Yeah, and there's a, I think uh, Tom, I sent you one of the accounts that happened right in the same location. Um, another link to uh, an encounter that also happened there. Yeah, uh, yeah. That little specific area. It's certainly not a hotbed in y'all's world, but uh, I think there's been about uh, three or four reported incidents. Now, how many haven't been reported? Who knows? Yeah, no, Texas is, to me, it's an interesting area, uh, especially when it deals with this creature, because there's a lot of them there, and they um, will correct, him, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they, uh, for lack of a better word, they're aggressive. They have attitudes. Yeah, short tempers. All the accounts I'm familiar with out here in West Texas, and there aren't thousands of them. You know, there's not ideal habitat. There's limited water and limited cover and vegetation. But, uh, you know, they can have all the cattle they can eat, that's for sure. The uh, uh, I just don't – every account I read from the – in the at least in the West Texas, I don't want to say every, but most of them are, are past curious. You know, it's past the curious um, who just wants to see something. You know, he's curious about you, you're curious about him. You know, that kind of moment. That that there's just seems to be some aggression behind the other one. And I, I you know, in looking back on this, if that's what it was, I think that I think you're right, Tom. I think it was. Well, I think you could be right that, that, that being drawn further away from my uh, my buddy, separated. Just like beaters, you know, sort of doing like reverse beaters on a lion hunt. Right? Yeah, exactly. And it's, here's the thing. It's, it's a, um, it's nothing new that we, we hear from time to time. We hear about this, you know, where people are being uh, baited or drawn in. And then they suddenly realize uh, they get that aha moment like what you had. This isn't right. I'm not getting what I'm after, uh, and I'm I'm being either separated from another person. I'm separated from my vehicle. I'm being drawn into an area where they can flank me. Yeah, I just I remember thinking, this hasn't. I don't see an end. I don't see a piece of terrain I can end this on up there. You know, um, and I'm pretty sure it was a bright moon that night because um, I remember seeing pretty well. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't see, like, there was this, you know, the the shoulders of the of the river were going to open up very quickly, you know, in another 100 yards. Uh, and uh, that way I'd be able to get a good look at it. You know, there didn't seem to be an end of it, at least one that I foresaw. Have you gone back there, uh, Colonel? Yeah, we have even camped back there um, uh, several times. I have not been back there in probably, last time I was there was when my kids were little. Uh, it's probably been 20, 20 years maybe since I've been there, but they uh, they no longer have access to that lease, so I can't. I mean, that was they they, they gave up the lease uh, back to the owner, so I can't physically go hike to that spot. Though I can certainly point to it on a map for you. Uh, but I was just wondering if there was any duplication of that type of experience there. Um, you know, he, my, me and my buddy have talked about it a good deal, I and mean, we're, we're we're still in constant contact. And um, you know, he leans the same way I do now that we've all kind of put it together. And and this piece, do you remember when this happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that when you went and did this, or I remember that noise that was being made. That's uh, West Texas, circa late 1970s, maybe early 80s. So you had another experience following that? I had another, um, yes. I had, uh, and I'm always hesitant, you know, this is such a rare creature. And when people have multiple, and I don't certainly don't consider myself one of those, it's just, you know, what are you doing right that you can keep seeing this thing? <laughs> um, uh, you know, all these times, and I... It, you know, I guess it's just geography and baiting and everything else we do is so different now than what the four horsemen would even thought about back then. Yeah, I was uh, in the Army, 
Fort Stewart, Georgia. This was um, fall of 87, September or October. Um, likely is not September or later in September. And we were in the middle of a, there's a place, I don't know if Will ever experienced it during his time, but there's a real uh, hellhole in the Army called the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California. And um, it's where you go, you deploy out there, your unit deploys, and uh, you go fight bad guys for two weeks. And it's merciless. I mean, it is merciless. And you got advisors all over you and observer controllers and, you know, you're getting your teeth kicked in all the time. I mean, it's just, it's just brutal. And back then, um, I don't know how they do all of that now, but, you know, in the 80s it was, you went through what was called a train-up. You would spend months in the field prior to that deployment just getting ready. You would spend months training just to get ready for that training. I mean, it's a Reagan's Reagan's president. There's lots of money, so we can, you know, you, you went and, and I, I'm grateful for it because it certainly taught me how to fight. Uh, I certainly learned my my craft out there and uh, didn't have to wait for Iraq to uh, to teach it to me. I I, I knew what I knew, and I, I knew what uh, my business was, and it taught me. But it's just I learned all the hard way, so it was always. Um, anyway, so we're getting ready to go to National Training Center right after the first of the year, and this is September. Uh, late September, maybe early October, and we have been on the train up for, I guess, since uh, right after Labor Day. So we've been out there three, four weeks max um, training. And I'm, I was a platoon leader at the time, and Fort Stewart crosses uh, Liberty, Tattnall, and I can't remember the other county. Um, um, can't, sorry, I can't remember it. But Fort Stewart's a really big fort, um, and it's the biggest. It used to be the biggest fort east of Mississippi. I have no idea if it is today, and it's just north of Savannah, um, a ways. It's basically a swamp. Soldiers called it Camp Swampy after the Beetle Bailey uh, cartoon, um, and so everything's elevated. The roads are all, you know, six feet in the air, uh, gravel tank trails. You know what I'm talking about, Will, with tank trails and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. These are all these are all these are all elevated. I don't know how they are at Fort Lewis. I've been to Fort Lewis, but I was never down range there. Um, these are elevated because they flood. It just it's a constant you know, it's the Savannah Rain Festival <laughs> year round. Comparable to the weather y'all probably got up there. With just it's a constant just constant rain. And it's a swamp and you're right on the uh, from the Atlantic and, you know, with, with, within grenade distance of the Atlantic. Anyway, so you've got to cross at times when you're training at Fort Stewart, uh, you have to cross uh, hardball roads that the public uses because training areas will be segregated or separated by or uh, uh, civilian highways and roads and things like that. And at Fort Stewart, that's just the way it is. They're just... Uh, roads bisecting the training area. So you have to, um, we were in a brigade, uh, which is just a tremendous amount of combat power. That is a lot of people. It's about 3,500 soldiers. And we were crossing one of these Georgia Highway, whatever, 120, I don't remember what it was. But you had to have MPs shut down the oncoming traffic. So at your crossing points, there were MP stands. And they would come out there, that it was concrete reinforced asphalt. Uh, they had uh, stations to where they'd, they'd park their vehicles and stations where they'd put the flashing lights and, you know, two MP cars would go out in each direction to halt the traffic. And you had to cross under that. You couldn't just sneak across. Well, you're tempting fate if you did. Um, anyway, we're crossing one night, and it's taken hours uh, to cross uh, going to the next objective or whatever we're doing, we're not we're not tactical necessarily. I don't I don't, I don't remember us being tactical, but I think it's more of an administrative move. But my platoon pulls up to the crossing point. I'm right I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I'm on time and everything else. But the brigade is taking too long, so the MPs are shutting down the crossing point right in front of me. I said, guys, I can get across this road in a minute. All four vehicles done. Sorry. 
times now. So it's it's frozen point shut down. So I get on the phone to my uh, my commander and tell him what the situation is. I'm look, I'm trapped on the side of this uh, hardball away from y'all. And he said, well, you know, go ahead and pull security and blah 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 and the uh, radio watch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I Roger outed, and then I went on and did just the opposite. I didn't do that. I uh, formed us into a herringbone, just which is like a circle of the vehicles. Uh, everybody's tactical, so in case just somebody's happened to sneak up and drive on it. And uh, we had been, we were smoked. We've been downrange for weeks now, and we were smoked physically, mentally. There was no rest. I mean, you, you weren't getting any sleep. It was just one thing after another. And so I made the decision since I was separated from the entire brigade and knew no one would come, be coming back this distance and the, the road crossing was closed, I made a decision to, in the Army, what we call going admin, um, which is where my strack platoon of, uh, of killers, uh, as soon as I told them that, uh, they turned into uh, Donald Pleasant's platoon and Kelly's heroes right away. I mean, it... It became turret wizards. So I don't think admin was out of my mouth <laughs> before they were all. I mean, you know, there's underwear flying from the antennas. There's just it just goes crazy right away. And 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 sounds like a normal caveat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've seen I've seen units that look like that when they are, you know, <laughs> when they're not on it. Uh, plenty of times, but they, anyway, and guys are sleeping. It's hot. It's humid. Guys are sleeping on top of their vehicles. I mean, it, the ramps are down, hatches are open, you know, got a radio watch going, you know, K pots and LBE are thrown into the vehicles, and, you know, you're not walking around with anything. You just, just in your BDUs and just enjoying the moment. The Army does teach you to enjoy moments, and you're just, ah. There's no one here, you know, no one's going to bother me. I'm not going to get told to go attack something at 2 o'clock in the morning because I can't get across the road for admin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to take this time to uh, crash a little bit. So we're all in this uh, herringbone, and we're kind of in a little clearing. I want to use the word like a, like a hammock in Florida where it's just a little bit of elevated ground. Um, I think that's the right term, right? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but the, we were just in a little bit. We weren't in the swamp. We were in a area elevated off of it. And it was fairly clear. There were uh, pine trees, but it was, a, it was an old-growth pine forest, so you could, you could see. Um, and the, uh, just outside the perimeter was a, uh, you know, what looked to me to be an old LZ, uh, because it was pretty round and, uh, uh, you know, kind of open for a bird to come in. Um, and we're, we're sitting there, and gosh, it's, it's not super late. Uh, and I'm sitting underneath a tree with my platoon sergeant, and we're, our backs are to the platoon, and we're just kind of staring out into the nothing, and we're just talking, just having a conversation. Typical soldier stuff. Probably lots of F-bombs and everything else being used. And from this open area was, this open area is probably 100 meters by 100 meters, circular. Not perfectly, it was overgrown in quite a bit, but meaning there wasn't a lot of pine trees and stuff in the way. It was, it was just kind of a, a little bit of a clearing. I guess in other parts of the world you'd say a meadow maybe. But we're just talking, nothing I mean, admin, I can hear the radio, you know, we're, we can hear the radio squelching. Um, all that's taken care of. we really got nothing to do. So we're just kind of enjoying that. And then, but it's very quiet overall. All you can really hear is the radio squawking because the soldiers went to sleep right away, which is what they do best, if you, if, in case you didn't know. They'll, they'll go to sleep anytime, anywhere, any place. But right in front of us, I don't know. 50, 75 meters, this, well, what I heard was a woman being murdered. That's the sound I heard. Enough that it brought both of us immediately to our feet. And nothing, there's nothing in front of us except forest. And I start walking towards 
the screen because I'm thinking there's a woman being you know, there's some woman you know being attacked over here. My platoon sergeant says, you know, in platoon sergeant language asks me to come back. He didn't say it like that, but you have to just know how platoon sergeants like to talk. But um, so I came back. I don't know what I was going to do, beat him to death with my empty nine mm, um, empty uh, M911 or not. But what's interesting at the same time that's going on is that I'm walking towards it. Platoons aren't telling me to come back, so I turn around and I come back. That my entire platoon look like prairie dogs. They're all wide awake, and they're all sticking their heads out of turrets, <laughs> you know, out of everything. So you got all these heads that have popped up from this noise, and everybody's just wide awake all at, at once. And soldiers always know what to do because they immediately started up their vehicles and closed the ramps, closed all the hatches, and went back to sleep <laughs> because nothing was going to get through an armored vehicle. So. Uh, it was just—it was just always interesting to me that they did that immediately. It was like a—it was like they'd been trained in a battle drill. Um, okay. How quickly they, res- they responded to that screen, uh, you know, uh, they didn't want anything to do with it, and they just locked themselves up in their vehicles. So it was pretty interesting. But over the years, I went back and forth on it, back and forth. What was that thing? And you know, for a while, I convinced myself it was Florida Panther. But I think the first sighting of a Florida Panther in Germany was in the 2000s. Um, that's the only panther in the region, and it's an extremely, as you know, it's an extremely rare animal. I think your chances of seeing a skunk ape are far higher than your chances of seeing, you know, a Florida panther. It's just very rare. And a Florida panther is not the same size as our cougars out here. It's a, it's a much smaller uh, cat, at least it, it appears to be in the, in the picture. And this was loud. You know, we call it the preolip. I'm sorry if I'm massacring that. Call it the Piolic scream. And really, that's either one or two animals screaming at each other. And it's several series of screams. Um, Just breaking it down and listening to it, there's scream, pause, scream, pause, scream, Mm -hmm. pause. That's the way I hear it anyway. I've never been in a sound studio, seen it broken down. But am I right, Will? Is that the way it... Yeah, right, right. And I lived just a few miles from there when that was going on. Oh. Well, that is pretty darn close. Just, 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 uh, it's not, um, it's not the whole noise they make, but it's just that if you just take that one screen and placed it about 100, 7,500 meters away from you and hearing that and seeing nothing. You know, I'm going to jump in real quick. I just want to comment on the sound that a mountain lion makes. Basically, and the reason for this in my mind is because the mountain lion is just a huge, overgrown house cat. Okay, mean house cat. But when they, and you and I talked about this uh, when we spoke earlier, they go, ow. It it starts high and goes down. Ow. Almost like a, you know, I've heard her scream. It's like a scream meow. Um, And it's. You can tell. If you've heard it once, you know exactly what it is. It's not a pleasant noise. I mean, it's a shocking noise, but it's the, it, it's not what I heard. Um, yeah, but, and that's uh, what I wanted to point out. Yeah, the uh, I think what we've got is uh, you read a lot of 19th century accounts about panther screaming. I think they're bumping into these things. Um, it's what I think they're doing. Because the 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 the, the Mountain lion noise that we're familiar with, or cougar, catamount, or panther, whatever, is my understanding is that it's a breeding noise, and it's done by females. And the female uh, cat, uh, the the mountain lion, can come into breeding at any time she wants to. The general breeding of the Florida panther, anyway, is November through... I think March, something like that. Uh, not to say that they can't breed in August if they choose to, but it's a breeding call. It's not a anything other than that. Meaning, if a Florida panther was creeping around out there, saw us, she wouldn't make that noise in surprise. You, she didn't think you guys were attractive enough, or yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, had couple, I had a couple of guys, probably. Uh, anyway, the, so it was. 
I mean, it was a woman screaming. And it was, uh, you know, it wasn't a five-minute long one or anything like that. It was very loud. It was right in front of us. Um, and it was over. I mean, it was over as soon as, you know, you stand up, what the? I mean, it just, just like you met, you're walking down a street in some city, you heard that, you would know that that's a woman under duress. And that's what I thought, except I was out in the middle of the swamp. And I really never, after that, you know, the next day, and then just got caught up in being soldier stuff and everything. And then when I was back in Texas, and I was driving between Houston and San Antonio, and just outside of San Antonio on I-10, there's a there's a, a creek that crosses the interstate, or the interstate crosses. The creek is called Woman Hollering Creek. Wait, where is this? This is in Texas? Yeah, it's, uh, no, I, would, well, I was in Georgia, this happened to me, but when I was back. Yeah, but the Texas, Woman Hollering Creek, is that in Georgia or Texas? That is in Texas. That is, oh, okay. years later, I noticed that. Uh, driving between Houston and San Antonio one time. I noticed that, and I thought, well, I wonder what that is. Because I heard a woman hollering out in the middle of the one night. And it's, uh, anyway, it's just outside of San Antonio. You can't miss it. I'm sure it's on, anybody can Google that up. You know, I, I was, uh, I've been to Fort Lewis a few times, but, you know, there's a tremendous amount of accounts out there. And just, it's a huge area, the training area. Oh, it's huge. You, you just um, a soldier the military accounts out of the heart place in my heart for oh yeah, um, yeah. and uh, you, you know you but there there seems to be something around reservations um, definitely I, I don't I've, know. Got a, I've got a friend that's a re retired first sergeant uh, he was at Fort Polk I can't remember what year he said but he was heading with his Humvee to one of the training areas that you know they were uh, doing some kind of, yeah they were doing some kind of an FTX out there and he thought he had to stop and take a leak, he said. So I stopped in the middle of the tank trail, and 50 feet away, one of these things screamed at him. <laughs> well, you're right there. I mean, gosh, there's so many coming off of, uh, you know, Missouri and Arkansas are very hot. In Absolutely. My I mean, that's a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, the deep south gets the a lot of attention, uh, but the mid and upper south, you know, has certainly got their accounts. Certainly does. Let me ask you something. You know, as a higher ranking officer, when you were stationed in places like that, did you ever hear stories? No, I, I would, uh, you know, I didn't start asking. I was very aggressive with my career. Um, and uh, you were either, I mean, back in the day, you were either deployed, you were going to deploy, or you were coming back from the deployment. Yeah, I hear you, you know? there. And then 9 11 happened. And, well, that changed every dynamic I'd seen. I'd been in the Army for, gosh, 12, 13 years at that point. And it it completely changed overnight, everything. So the the, the it's just it's all different now. It's uh, uh, you know I, I, by that point I was you know I was just up doing you know step and fetch for general officers. So you know I didn't I wasn't down at the lieutenant level learning anymore. I was just producing. Um, so but it's uh, everybody's off tempo went crazy. I mean everything switched deployments. Every it just didn't have time to think, and uh, uh, I would have preferred to go. I, I went back to Iraq and said I wanted to go to Afghanistan, but I couldn't swing that, and uh, ended up going back to Iraq. But I wanted to go to Afghanistan just because that, you know, you're kind of getting into different country over there. Yeah, you're 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 you're, you're getting close to some tall, hairy folks. Uh, uh, yes, you are. Country. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm my curiosity wanted me to go there, but. I was just so well. I was just so focused on my career every day that that, uh, and then and what didn't take my was my family. So you know, four kids and uh, right uh, married and just so you know, you come home and you're like you're in that you know you're in that engagement area for the next twelve hours, and you go to work and you're in that engagement area. For 12 and, hours. and that's so the way it is when you're just, when you're in harness. You're you're focused on what you're doing. That's correct. That's correct. You don't. You you got. Uh, your 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 iron sights are at about uh, fifty meters. Exactly. And uh, you're going to hit anything that comes into your engagement area. But other than that, you're not. You know, if it comes into your buddy's engagement area, <laughs> well, <laughs> sucks for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, they. Uh, yeah, just I, I think that there's something that more that needs to be done on on soldiers, on airmen. I mean, all of these 
there's so many accounts that are out there and they're kind of disjointed and all over the place that that would just that always just appeals to me more than anything else um, I understand the guy in the trailer park that sees one because I'm from that world uh, but you know the the 19 year old in a decent half which we don't have anymore by the way <laughs> uh, you know that's that's vehicles broke down on a tank trail someplace and then one of these things walks up right right so what do they what do they do you know not, yeah, he's got he, he's got blanks. If he's got that at all, you know, he's probably doesn't even have blanks. He's just got his weapon. I, I have uh, I have two more things that, again, I'm not saying they're related. I'm not saying they're not. But these are two more things, and I don't know where to categorize them. You know, I don't know which in my in the pigeonholes that are in my mind. I don't know to replace these three by five cards. So I'm just going to tell you, Easter weekend, uh, Bear County. Uh, which is around San Antonio. We're on the far outskirts of Bear County, out where it was definitely uh, rural. It's not anymore, but it was then. Uh, it's Easter weekend because I know we'd, we'd had an Easter egg hunt, and I'm probably seven or eight. Um, and me and my cousin are doing what at least young Texas boys do. We go into the wood line. You know? <laughs> it's, uh, so you go, you go see what's in the woods. You just go hang out in the woods, and that's what you did. And we're going through the woods and uh, find a dead fawn. And it is at most a week old, at most, if it's that. It is a tiny little thing. And it is torn completely in half. Um, and by that I mean the rear skeleton is still attached to the fore skeleton. The front part of the deer from the, from the rib cage up, it looked like a baby deer on the ground that was very alive and very, there were no flies on it. There was nothing on it yet. So I knew it was fresh even back then. And it wasn't stiff because I, of course I picked it up. I was a little boy. Um, but half of it was skeletal, no gut pile, not anything left on the back half of the skeleton. I mean, tissue and sinew and all that stuff. Just, you know, the, 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 the bossy, the glossy bone matter. But the forward half of the thing was complete. And it was probably about 75 meters off the person, back of a person's house where we found it. It wasn't I, – I, maybe you guys know what that is. I, don't, I still to this day don't. Alan, was it um, – so it was dismembered in, in half? The lower the, – the, the front portion of the deer was complete. Looked like a live little deer. The back portion, the skeletal remains were still attached, but there was no muscle, no skin, no tissue, nothing to include no gut pile. It was as if something came up and ripped the skin off the back half of the fawn and ate it from halfway down. Am I painting a good yeah. enough picture there? I don't know if I am or not. You're doing an excellent job. And, and um... What is that? It's very strange. It's uh, the only thing I I can think of, it, and Will, uh, you know about this. The gal that you interviewed, um, the you know the elk in Oregon, where basically they her dad shot the elk. They ended up there like I think twenty or thirty minutes max after the kill, and the elk was completely skinned. I don't want to say field dress, but it was, I mean, it was, there's just nothing left. The hydras removed, the hindquarters were gone. Um, some of the hooves were laying there. Yes. The head was gone, yes. And and he's holding, I don't know if it was her husband or her dad was holding one of the hooves. And you could see no tools. It was broken. It had just been, it was broken. And there was one area in that, you know, it's that kind of dusty volcanic dirt. Uh, there was like a footprint, large, large uh, footprint in there with mud on or, or blood on it, rather. You could just barely kind of make it out. That's the closest I can think of. Uh, and also, the, my understanding is, and, I, and I'm no expert, and I'm not even close to it, these creatures tend to, uh, and I think it's similar to chimps as well, 
will go after internal organs because that's where the nutrients are. But I can't explain, you know, why you'd have half a deer that's still there and the other half where you said you just skeleton, right? Skeletal, you know, there was probably little tissue on it, but not much. I mean, it looked like it, it, it looked like you'd taken a pair of scissors. Yeah. Cut it through the abdomen and field dressed the entire hindquarters of the animal, but you left the bones on and there was no gut tile. There was not the normal, you know, uh, macabre results of, you know, that, uh, that, that, that process. There was nothing. And the thing was still, um, you know, because I dragged it back to the my cousin's house because <laughs> that's what I, what I guess little boys do. And, of course, my cousin, who was a microbiologist, it, um, freaked out and, you know, uh, scalded my hands, <laughs> you know, going, getting me scrubbed out and everything else like that. But Because uh, I thought, hey, this is cool. It's half a deer. Yeah, uh, right. You know, um, sounds to me like uh, sounds to me like you may have interrupted something. That's why it was it took the back portion, but you interrupted it before it could take the front and uh, digest it. it. Well, here's the fawn. Here's here's my thought: why it was still left there, and especially being a fawn, and the bones were there. If it was an adult, if it was a Sasquatch, if it, if it was an adult, it would have eaten the bones. Uh, and it was carried off the remainder. It was probably a juvenile. Well, I didn't think about that. Just just a, a thought, though. How do, you, how, do you, how do they train their young to hunt? Exactly. I mean, they, they must <laughs> teach them how to do all that. I'll bring you back a fawn so you can, you know. Sure. Yeah, exactly. It starts eating, and either they left for some reason and left the carcass. I mean, who knows? You know, but if if it was one of these creatures, that's my guess. It was probably a juvenile. Yeah, just like a lion cub bringing in, you know, here. Yeah, exactly. Kind of kind of moment. But, you know, what bothered me was the no gut pile. What bothers me in hindsight, no gut pile. It wasn't stinking. There was not a fly on. Nothing. No after effects. Nothing. And it was still very flexible. No, but no swelling, no puckering, no nothing. I mean, it was. It looked like the fawn was walking along, fell over dead, and then that happened. Whatever that was, but it is bothered. I I don't know if it's related to any of this or not. I just wanted to put it out there, Will. So yeah, it's very but strange. I mean, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off a while ago. By the way, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you didn't. Um, the question I have is, your you took it to your a relative who is a biologist, field biologist? Microbiologist. Microbiologist. Did he have an opinion? No, she didn't. She, uh, other than I was gross and, and uh, do not <laughs> ever touch dead bodies. You know, don't, uh, and don't bring him back to the house. <laughs> but yeah. because I drug it up, I'm like the dog bringing in the kill. Hey, look at this. Look what the mighty hunter has returned. You know? <laughs> Because I was fascinated because the front half looked alive. Right. It looked completely mm. normally alive, like it, you found it, you know, like when a mother leaves it. A doe leaves their, her, her, her fawns, you know, it, it was, but it's, it, I don't know what it was, but it's always bothered me. Of course, uh, Bernie, Texas, in that area, that area of the Hill Country certainly has its share of sightings as well. What always has taught me is whenever I'm rural, and I'm, I'm that way a lot with ranchers or stuff like that going out, I always ask, or if I'm ever around a police officer or especially a game warden, and I'm just talking to them, I always ask, what's, I don't lead with the big man. I just say, what's the most interesting thing you've ever come across? And I was at a rancher's a couple of years ago. It's old ranch, old Texas ranch, and uh, last generation on it, old lady in her 80s. And uh, we're having a we're having a nice lunch there with several people, and I do my thing. I you know I get her cornered and we're talking about stuff. And I say, "What's the most unusual thing you've ever seen here?" And without missing a beat, she said, "A baby gorilla." Well, now that's interesting. That's all I got. Didn't get anything else. Just a baby gorilla next to a tank. Tank out here is what well, tank is a pond in the rest of the world, and Texas it's a tank. Um, so, 
Well, listen, fellas, we're out of time. Anybody have any questions or for uh, for Alan or Alan, if you have anything for us? No, no, not at all. Thank you for having me on. It's been a real pro- real pro- pleasure on my part. Alan, I'll, I'm going to send you a picture. i got something to show you after that last piece you mentioned. <laughs> you, you'll appreciate it. Okay. I'm all for pictures. You bet. All right, fellas. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thanks, Alan. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you. You're, I mean, you're welcome. You're welcome. Very interesting. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, Alan. We certainly appreciate your time, and thanks again. Humble to be asked. Welcome back from the break, everyone. We have Norma and Bob with us today. Um, you have some updates for us, I hear. Yeah, uh, quite, a, quite a little bit. Um, we've noticed a lot of activity in the last two months in the um, area that we research. And we've been going there um, basically weekly, sometimes, you know, twice a week. Um, and, we, you know, Will, I, I, I wrote you and told you about, uh, one of the, the, the things that was happening, um, that I wasn't, I was like, I don't understand, you know, and I've been doing this for 15 years and of course, you know, you're learning all the time. <laughs> um, but in this particular area that we've been researching in for, uh, at least 13 of those. 15 years. Um, this has been the most activity in this one location that we've ever seen. And when we go there and when we've been going there, um, every, every single time there's activity, you know, there's something, uh, that's moving around directly around us, you know, in the area that we are in. And, you know, at first, you, you always write it off as, you know, woodland creatures, uh, you know, deer, you know, something like that. Um, but as we, as we keep going on through the night, you know, it proves to us that it's not. Like, there'll be a, 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 a branch break or there'll be a knock or, you know, something like that. The last time that we talked to you, the last time that we were on your show, um, we had talked about those howls that we heard and those uh, very loud wood knocks that we heard. That's included in part of this, um, you know, eight weeks or so that we've been going there. So when I had uh, messaged you about, you know, that uh, sort of activity, and it doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, it just, it's just walking around us, meandering. It's not really doing a whole lot. And it's not leaving either. You know, it's staying there. And we will, you know, put our spotlights out. We'll be looking around. And it doesn't phase it, I guess. Um, we were in the car uh, the other night. And uh, actually, it was probably a couple of times that we were there. Uh, and we put the air conditioner on, you know, we put the car on and put the air on to cool off because it was, you know, hot. And nothing is deter- or deterring this, you know, um, creature from leaving. So this has been going on for quite some time. And I started to think about, um, you know, a couple of days ago why this is happening. And a couple nights ago, um, was was pretty much the the determining factor of what I was thinking of why this is happening. So I'll get into that, I guess, in a minute. But one of the nights uh, a few weeks ago, we were because we hadn't been we 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 were kind of busy for for like two weeks, and the weather was kind of you know stormy and you know not not good for going out to do any uh, research. So. It was a couple weeks, two or three weeks, before we were able to get there uh, again. And when we went, 
the same thing was happening. There's movement all around us. Um, there's, you know, twigs snapping. It sounds like something is, is walking and, you know, snapping. The, it's, it's different from, from what you hear with, that a deer does, you know. It's actually like when you put your foot down and you hear that cracking all the way, you know, like your foot is going over those, those um, branches or those little twigs. And you can hear that whole, that whole uh, movement of the foot cracking those, those twigs. So this is what we're hearing. And the, the last time, before yesterday or uh, a couple nights ago, before that, when we went, um, there was the same movement. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm set, you know, Bob and I talked to each other while we're out there like, hmm, I wonder, <laughs> you know, is it going to do anything? Um, and I said, well, I guess time will tell, you know, if it's a deer or if it's, you know, something else um, or if it's, you know, a squatch or something, um, I guess time will tell. And sure enough, uh, little bits, little times uh, during this duration of being there, you know, a bigger branch would snap or um, I think what at one point and it gets close to us too. It doesn't like, it doesn't come up and, you know, touch the vehicle or anything, but it gets pretty, it gets pretty close. So um, at one point toward probably three quarters into the time that we were there, all of a sudden we hear a partial step. And then we hear step, 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 and then another partial step. Like it just took a half step and stopped. And Bob and I were like, uh, <laughs> that was, first of all, it was close. Second of all, it was definitely, it was, clear. It was so clear and it was definitely oh, wow. bipedal. And this is like, you know, three in the morning and this thing had been, around us the whole entire time we got there at like midnight and this thing was just it just you know just hangs around us and then after that prior to that we had heard um like i said these you know uh stick breaks and um uh, other things that that made us you know kind of you got a moan that night. yeah oh yeah we got a moan that night too uh, and that was, was different. That was in between the walking. It was it was weird. Low moan. Yeah, it was a very and it was very close. It was a very low moan. Very um I don't know, it was, it was just so you know, it wasn't prominent, but it was you could hear it, but we didn't hear it until after we listened to the uh the H two after. And we listened, or actually, I think I heard it, and I asked Bob, yeah, I did. I heard it, and then I asked Bob if he heard it, and then he said he didn't, and he he heard it when he listened, when we both listened to the H2 um, again the on the recording, and he's like, wow, I didn't even hear that, but I mean, I heard it, and he didn't hear it, but then he heard, we both heard it again when we listened to it on the H2, so it was the walking first. And then there was that low moan, and it was close. It wasn't far away. It was very close. And then um, after that, toward the end of the night before we left, there was a huge uh, tree break, you know, a branch break. And so that kind of cinched it at the, you know, at the end of the night when that happened. And then, of course, we left um, before daybreak. So that was one of the incidences that happened most recently. But again, prior to that, this, this same thing was happening over and over and over every time that we went there. And when I had mentioned that to you, I said, you know, well, what, what else, you know, could this be that would, you know, act like this and do this um, every single time that we went there? And you had mentioned it being a sentry, you know, a, a watcher. And, you know, that makes sense. To me, that makes sense. To Bob, that makes sense. We're like, okay. So this thing is out there watching us. 
that that's okay. It, it you know it throws a couple you know pebbles or something toward us, but you know it doesn't it doesn't do a whole lot. It just 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 stays there and watches us. And so this, like I said, this has been going on for a while. So the night before last night, we went there. It was just Bob and I, and we do what we normally do. And as soon as we get there, and this happens every single time, as soon as we get there, we can hear something out there. And once again, we're not going straight to Bigfoot. We are just waiting to see what's going to happen. So we get there about, um, I think it was about 11 o'clock uh, that night. Set up everything, you know, settle in. We're in the pitch black. <laughs> pitch black. It's so dark out there. And we're just listening to all the night sounds. We can hear something out there once again. Although the difference this night was it sounded like things were coming from different areas, mm -hmm. you know. Multiple. Mult like multiple um areas where we're hearing things and Bob was having an issue the first 10 minutes with his earbuds so we had to end up we we ended up changing those because he wasn't hearing what I was hearing and for some reason I don't know what was going on with the earbuds but we ended up changing them and then <clears throat> excuse me and then we could hear then he could hear everything that was going on so once again we're listening and at one point early on so this is probably about uh, 20 minutes after we get there. Um, actually, no, it was, it was within that 10 minutes because I heard walking. I heard steps and I said to Bob, um, <laughs> did you, did you hear that? And he's like, no, I didn't hear that. I said, okay, well, how can you not hear that? <laughs> and then a plane went overhead and I said, did you hear the plane? And he's like, no, I didn't hear that. And that's when we realized something was wrong with the earbuds. So, after we got that all settled and, and we were listening to things, then he was hearing everything that I was hearing um, that was going on out there. So multiple or different areas that we were hearing things from. And a couple times I said, Bob, I, I, think, I think this is on my side. But yet, at the same time, there would be, there would be something happening, you know, uh, in another area. So I said, I don't know. I think there's... I think there's more than one out there. So we're listening, and about a half an hour in, we turn the lights on because this, it sounded like it was getting close. So we turn the lights on, and the headlights of the, of the vehicle on, and then I took the spotlight and started looking out on my side of the uh, vehicle. And I started to scan left to right, and into the woods, and, and as I'm doing that, I, I go all the way to the right as far as I can go, and I see by a tree, I see this, what appears to be eye shine, but it's, it's smaller, all right, like the size of a child's eye, so, and it's just right by the, right by a tree, right by the edge of the tree, you know, only one. And so I'm looking there, and I didn't really say anything to Bob at that point. I'm just, like, staring at it. So the beam of my, of my uh, light is, is right on this, this um, potential eye shine. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, what is this eye shine? Is, what is it? So I stay there, and I, I watch it for a little bit. It doesn't move. It doesn't do anything. So I'm like... Um, maybe it's just because we had had a storm um, earlier that day and I thought, well, maybe it's water on, you know, foliage just reflecting from the light. So I thought, all right, maybe that's it. You know, there's water over there on, on a leaf or on a branch or something like that. And it's just reflecting because again, this didn't move. So I, I, I was there, I, probably watching it for about a minute and then um i just scanned back and then i shut the light off and we just sat in the dark and we're listening to all of these things that were going on big snaps of branches walking movement and it was getting you know it would get closer to us and then it would 
go away. And then we'd hear something from another, again, a different area. And I think I said several times to Bob, I think it's, I think there's something on my side, you know, I think it's on my side. (laughs) And, but again, you know, we're hearing it from another, another area. So a, a few times we turn that light back on a half an hour later, Something gets close. We turn the headlights on. I get my spotlight out again, and I'm scanning again. I scan left to right and go back to where the, I saw that that reflection, and it's not there. It's gone. And I said to Bob, that, that eye shine that I saw or that reflection that I saw is not there now. And he said, really? I said, yeah. There's, there's nothing there. I said, what, what was it? And where is it? You know, so it's gone. And I said, huh. So I'm looking around and I'm looking, you know, further and deeper into the woods. And I thought I saw something, another reflection, but it was more, um, I don't know. It was in between a lot of trees. So it was hard to tell. And I know out there, there's no, there's nothing out there that can reflect, um, anything with no, this with the, the spotlight we yeah, yeah we know the area well and we're there all the time and we see you know there's nothing that would reflect away from that or or in the woods like that so i see some kind of reflection in between the trees and it's it, you know it's far enough away it was probably about i don't know maybe from where the the other reflection was by the tree it was probably about 70 or 80 feet away from that deeper into the woods. The first one was about 30 or 40. The first one that I saw was about, as from us, it was about probably 60, 60 feet away, somewhere around there, 50, 50. 60 feet away. Um, and then from that, from that reflection, if I if I put my spotlight to the you know left and further into um, the woods. That's where I was seeing another faint reflection uh, that was a, a lot higher up. So I was kind of, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what that is either. Um, so I just, again, we, we shut off the spotlight and I said, I don't know. I don't know where that thing went or what it was, you know, that I saw that first reflection. And, and this first reflection, this first eye shine that I saw wasn't very high off the ground. It was probably about four feet off the ground. And so that's why I thought, well, maybe it's a deer, you know. But again, it was gone. And of course, the deer can be gone. So then it wasn't there anymore. Then I saw that other reflection. Then I, you know, another half an hour goes by or so. And we put the light on again, because again, these things are getting close to us. And we're hearing snaps and all kinds of things that are happening, activity, you know, walking, moving all around us. Not, it wasn't drastic, but it was, it was, you know, you could hear it and it was pretty prominent. So here it is about um, 1.30 in the morning. And again, we put our lights on. And again, I take the spotlight out and, and I'm like, why why can't we see these things? I'm, these things are truly hide-and-seek champions. <laughs> they, they are amazing that they can hide that well. Um, so I take the spotlight out again. I scan it from left, to right, left and right again. And I go back to that spot where I first saw that, that reflection, that eye shine. And it's there again. In the same exact spot that it was the first time I saw oh, it. This is later. an hour later. And so the first time I saw it, half an hour later, it was gone. Half an hour later, there it is again. And so I have this, I'm like, what? I said, Bob, that re- that that eye shine is there again. And he said, what? <laughs> like, it's there. He goes, it's in the same spot. I, I said, I'm looking straight at it. And it's just staring at me. And, you know, I'm looking at this thing. It's just staring. It's just looking straight at me. I'm straight on this eye. And I said, what is that? You know? 
and it's in the same spot. And so I'm, I'm watching it, and while I'm watching it, things, uh, action is uh, yeah, starting to ramp up. The, the noises around us are starting, the light. Yeah, it's starting to ramp up, huh? ramp up. So we have this light, this beam on this eye shine, just directly on it, not moving from it. And I said, what is this? So it's just, and Bob's like, well, what is it doing? I said, it's just staring right at me. <laughs> it's just staring no, at the it. light. Not yet. So um, I'm watching it. And then all of a sudden, and we're trying, you know, there, like I said, there's movement around us and we're trying to um, focus on, we're very focused on this, this eye shine. And all of a sudden it moves it moves slightly and it goes behind the tree and comes back out again. And then I'm, I said, Bob, it moved. I said, you said, it, you said it was amber too. Yeah. It was, it was like, it wasn't a, um, a, a dark amber, like the adults that I have seen. It was a lighter, like, hmm, I don't know how to explain it. It was a lighter amber color. Um, and so, <laughs> I said, Bob's like, well, what color is it? <laughs> and I said, oh, I can't. I mean, I see the amber, but it's not like the dark amber, you know, that I saw before. So I'm watching it and it's going behind the tree and then coming back out. And it's not staying there very long. It's just kind of peeking. It's going in, it's peeking out. And then it stayed out for a little bit again. And then um, it went behind the tree just partially so I could see part of the eye still there but not the whole eye and then it would come out again full eye then it would go back again partial and it was doing this for a while and I would tell Bob up oh, it's gone up oh, wait it's back <laughs> and he was trying to look over and I think he saw it once was it, didn't you see I it could, once? I couldn't get the angle on it. He was in a different angle and and he I think he saw it once but that was it. And then it was coming in and out. And I said, Bob, it's, it's out again. Oh, wait, it's back in again. He goes, well, <laughs> and then it's partially out. I said, wow, what, what is this? You know, what is going on? And then, um, Hey Norma, and, I'm going to, yeah. I want to jump in for both of you guys. I got a kind of a comment and a, and a sure. question. Um, so number one, you're definitely getting, um, it's, and I'm going to ask for Will's comment on this as well, but it sounds like you're getting an escalation and the creatures are studying you. I think you know, here's, here's what I'm thinking. They're bringing the juveniles in. Yep. You guys are offering an excellent opportunity for them to study you probably more than you're studying them. And when you see the eyes and they disappear, um, do you see anything besides the eyes? Do you see a, a like a silhouette or a, or a shape or anything, or are you, are you just seeing the amber reflection? Yeah, I wasn't seeing anything um, anything other than that because the, I think because the light was so directly on it. I mean, right. I, I you know I couldn't see anything else. All I could see was um, just the eye shine, and I mean it, it was just looking straight at me. You know, right. and, and that's exactly what it's doing is it's looking right at you. Um, and, you know, you said, well, gosh, it disappeared. And then it, it came back like, you know, what, an hour later. It right. may have moved. It may have just poked its head behind the tree. But it's also very likely <clears throat> that the creatures are learning to close their eyes. Well, Stay I in mean, the same location. Yeah. Closes its eyes. And I do believe they learn this um, <clears throat> tactic because I think they understand very well about eye shine. Um, it may have, you know, again, <clears throat> it may have moved or it may have just simply closed its eyes. But it, it's very likely that it stayed in the same location. And I think these creatures oftentimes will remain perfectly still. And want, they, they don't have an appointment that they have to be somewhere at a certain time. Their sense of timing, uh, for lack of a better word, is 
not ours. You, you uh, mind if I jump in here, Tom? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Will. Uh, a couple things. Number one, you know, you and I were texting about this just moments ago. Uh, yeah, they, they were probably, if I were to give an opinion, um, using your presence as a learning tool for the juveniles. On the eye shine thing, I'm not so sure about that. You know, I, I've seen eye shine a number of times over the years, and they never seem to really care. You know, not like they weren't aware of it. Um, the well, fact, they're that, <laughs> yeah, the fact. I mean, they're they're watching. You know, but as far as them hiding eye shine, I don't, I don't know that they do that. I, I don't know, haven't heard or seen any kind of indication that sh demonstrates that. But um, watching you, absolutely learning from it, absolutely. So that's that's my es estimation at the point anyway. Well, it was, it, you know, it was going in and or back outside and uh, behind the tree and out and behind the tree. Testing um, the waters. Yeah, but it, here, here's the thing. At one point, it, I could tell that it had turned its head a little bit because I could see part of another eye, a partial eye. And then it turned back and all I could see was the one eye or, or it did something where I could partially see the other eye, but. You know, it was, it was probably as close, I would have to say, um, it was probably like the distance of a child's, you know, eye, about the same size and the distance of a child's eye. So, or I, you know, uh, size anyway. So at, so it came back out and it was just, you know, there. Now we had had the spotlight on it for, at this point, probably four minutes. And it came back, you know, it stayed out there, and all of a sudden I saw it blink. Three times I saw it blink. And then when that happened, again, we're on this thing solidly for about four minutes, coming up to five minutes. And we, there was a wood knock, uh, probably uh, not that far from where this eye shine was. There was a wood knock. And then... About probably a minute after the wood knock, there was a tree break, you know, like a, a branch, a, a bigger, loud branch break. And we weren't even really deterred by that. But as I told you before, when we, when we saw the eye shine again and we focused on it, the movement around us started to ramp up. So we get that wood knock and then we get that tree break not far from where you know, we all were in reference to each other. And we, again, we were just so focused on this eye shine and what was going on with it that we weren't really concerned about the well, tree break. We weren't paying much attention. We weren't, yeah, we weren't paying a whole lot of attention to, you know, it's there on the, the knock and the, and the tree break. But until we got a bigger, closer tree break, and this thing was massive. Um, <laughs> well, we think that it was just a little bit frustrated that we're focusing the light on the baby. We think that this is a, a young juvenile that was behind the tree. And it had stayed there for a while. And again, um, when we were after that large, huge tree break, Bob was, <laughs> Bob was like, um, that, are, are they planning something? <laughs> You know, are are they scheming something to, he goes, because there's more than one. Are they, you know, are they, are they coming up with a plan um, sort of thing? And, well, and then, I think, uh, they got a little frustrated I, think I think that they the were, was on the beat. And, and I don't know, my, I guess my take on it was that if this was a juvenile and this thing was not very was big, not even a juvenile. my four-year-old grandson, you know, is like 40. 40 inches, 40 something inches. And I would have to liken it to his, to his height where, where it was in the whole entire time, that height and coming behind the tree and stuff like that. It was just at that same height. So, um, when that huge tree break happened and we we're, you know, we were getting a little concerned because that activity had gotten ramped up before that huge tree break happened. Um, Bob's like, yeah, I think, I think we should probably go. It's probably not happy that we're, focused on this baby. potential juvenile or baby you know that's behind the tree 
And, uh, and so we left. And as we're leaving, I still have my light on it. And I, as we're, the car is moving, I see the eye shine. And then it slowly goes behind a tree. And this tree that it went behind and has been behind was not very big. So I, I'm almost certain that it wasn't a, an adult on even on all fours or, you know, crouched down. Um, because I, I think I would have seen something on either side of this tree. This tree was not very big. So this little thing could easily hide itself behind this tree. And as we were going, like I said, I'm watching, I'm still watching as we're moving and getting a different angle. And that eye shine just slowly went behind the tree. And I watched it for a while and it didn't come back out after that. And so as we were leaving on the way home, we were talking about it and we were pretty excited about it. Um, but I said to Bob, you know, I wonder if these were parents of this juvenile, which I, you know, more than likely were. Um, and they were getting upset because we had that spotlight on that child, on that juvenile for five minutes, you know, and we weren't taking it off. It's been found out. We know where it is. And I said, you know, deer do that, right? Well, I mean, a deer will take their, their fawn and plant it somewhere and go out foraging. And that baby will stay there until the mother comes back and gets it. It'll be still. It'll just, you know, sit there or lay there. And it won't move until the mother comes back and gets it. So it felt like it was similar to that, you know. They take their juvenile and they say, okay, here you go. Sit right there, Junior, and don't move. We'll be back, you know. And But at some point, this thing, you know, was looking behind the tree. So I don't know. I feel like that was probably what was happening. They were getting a little nervous that we were focused on this, you know, this child or juvenile for so long. And it started to make them nervous. And, man, let me tell you, that last it was a big <laughs> last tree break was pretty much, <laughs> it was you know, big. get out, you know, get away from, you know, get, get out, get out, leave. get that spotlight off my kid, and <laughs> you know, we're not going to tolerate. We, we got the message. <laughs> we pretty much got the message, yeah. Because again, it started that activity started to ramp up as soon as we put that spotlight on that on that eye shine and stayed there for the five minutes that we were trying to figure out what was going on. It was um, hard not to watch it. I mean, oh, it was it so does, hard. It doesn't happen. Often. And I did such a rookie mistake. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I should, I, I told you, I think I told you that we got a night vision. We got night vision binoculars. They are, they work so well. And, um, you can video, you can, you can video picture. and you can it, take still photos. Well, guess what? That night vision it, binocular <laughs> was never in my out. bag <laughs> and I never took it it's, out and I'm I, after on the way home I'm like what the it's heck it's like one part of your brain shuts down yeah. you're not even thinking about the I, other other the fact that you could have been taking pictures or video this whole incident I could have been yeah I could have been video of what are we doing we're just staring thing. at it <laughs> and and I'm like what what was I thinking I'm not I'm not used to having this for one thing I think we've only taken it out once and this was the second time, and I was like, what? Why, why didn't I have that thing out? I could have videotaped everything that was going on. I could have taken still photos. I'm like, what was, what, that's like, so rookie mistake. And I shouldn't be making these rookie mistakes. <laughs> oh, Norm, I, I can tell you, it's not necessarily a rookie mistake. Um, you know, I've, I've mentioned this, you know, my buddy Jack and I were uh, in an area adjacent to Bluff Creek, a number of years back and you know we had talked about this in depth earlier that day and we both had camcorders in our hands and a, and a little year old bear comes zipping out in front of the truck we followed it for probably a hundred yards it zipped off into the brush we stopped and looked at each other and said we didn't get a damn picture of that right <laughs> i i i was like what what was I thinking? And somebody else had mentioned that. And I was like, I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, I'm not used to having this yet. You know, this is a new piece of equipment and it's, yes, it's cool. And yes, I can do these things with it, but man, I had ample time to get that thing out and get some video of that, you know, peeking around the tree thing. 
It's just and so was easy to forget it. I know, yeah. oh, man. I was so upset. And, and they said, well, you know, you'll do it next time. And I, oh, actually, I think it was Lisa <laughs> or Lisa or, or my friend uh, Fred that we, we talk about a lot. Um, well, you, you know, you'll, you'll get it next time. I said, I don't think there's going to be a next time. This was like a one of a one in a lifetime, yeah. <laughs> you know, and maybe it will happen again. Who knows? But I mean, seriously, how did I not take that out and do that? I, I was just so focused. We were just so focused yeah. on this. Um, Norma, you, know, you hit the nail on the head. It's, <clears throat> it's, uh, and Will, you've probably heard this term before. It's, target fixation oh, and so you yes. get a kind of a tunnel vision yeah yeah for sure for sure but man i could just slap myself for that <laughs> <laughs> I, that could have been just epic you know having that on on video and just would have been phenomenal um but you know oh well hindsight right but at any rate, you know, that's the feeling that we were getting and we were talking about that, you know, all the way home. We actually called my, it was, you know, one thirty quarter. Well, by the time we left, I think it was like quarter of two in the morning. And uh, I called our, our friend Fred and I said, oh, man, <laughs> you you got to hear this, you know. And so we were talking about it with him and he was supposed to come out with us. Uh, yes. Last night we had gone out again and he and another friend of ours came out. They were in uh, one car and we were in another. Well, the family wasn't there last night. No, for, they didn't like the activity. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't happy. But that century, that century yeah. was there. And it was for sure there. We could hear it. We could hear steps. We could hear the movement around the rocks us. Rocks. Um, you know. Small pebbles. Small little pebbles were being they, thrown were at us. Metal. And they were hitting. They were hitting the They were hitting the cars. But they had to have been pretty small because they were, like, pinging off the vehicles. And so, you know, we're in separate cars. And I said to Bob, maybe they don't like that, you know, yeah, Fred and Jim are with a us. A strange car. A strange car is behind us. Maybe, you know, they're kind yeah, they're of. they're familiar with us. Yeah, so. they're, they're very familiar with <laughs> us. Um, but maybe this, you know, they're not too happy with us. But we're hearing this. And it wasn't constant. It was every once in a while, and then it would, you know, kind of be really quiet and kind of move quietly, and then you'd hear a, a, a little bit of a bigger branch break. Um, and then, again, um, shuffling. We were hearing shuffling. Um, we were even hearing, and I think the night, the, the night before last, when, when the, the potential family was there, um, we were hearing... Uh, tongue pops and yeah and definitely definitely tongue pops that we've yeah. not heard before some like clicks and, and clicks and we were hearing that last night too we were hearing these clicks and these tongue pops from whatever it was that was out there and this is a what first. was the duration of the clicks would, uh, would they go click 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 or was it a click uh, and were they coming from the same direction um, same creature or was it coming from well, you yeah, know possibly flanked um, you know, at, I thought that there were more than that. There was more more than one out there. I had mentioned that to Bob. I said I think there's more than one. But the clicks seemed right. like at times they were in succession, and then you would hear it click, click, you know, or click, 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 you know, or something like that. Um, but we were hearing them, and I said, Bob, you know, that sounds like clicks. And he goes, Yeah. They weren't overly rapid. They weren't. They weren't overly rapid, but they would be, you know, three or four in succession, you know. And then um, every once in a while, we'd hear that pop, you know, the the tongue pop. Is it, it was new things that we were hearing last night, and some other weird noises that <laughs> we don't we we don't even know what what it was, you know. Um, but. Definitely, we could we could pick out the tongue pops, and we heard that the night of, of you know where the family was at, um, and we could we could hear that too, and clicks, and then with this century um, last night we could hear that too, and we heard some um, you know branches being broken off of tr off of trees, um, but not not they weren't substantial, you know. They definitely weren't like the ones that, you know, when we were watching that juvenile. 
but um, something to let them know or let us know that they were there. And it was pretty disciplined too. It yeah, stayed it's still so, for about four. You know, we're there four hours plus. It's amazing. It um, really didn't do a lot. Yeah, it, it it's, just kept an eye and on. And it us. never does. It never does it when we're out us. there. Um, with this particular century that we keep, you know, keeps happening every time we go out there. Now this is two months, okay, two plus months that we've been going out there, and this stuff is is has been happening. The the first thing was was the, um, I think it was the knocks and the howls, but the century was there at the same time. Uh, so this century seemed to be there um, every time that we go there. It's like it's watching us. Okay, they're here. We're going to keep an eye on them, whatever. So we were talking about that as we were going home, too. Um, and the next day, you know, yesterday we were talking about it. And we feel like, we feel like that, um, they, there, there might be a family group that has moved into this area somewhere close well, by. Well, the baby that night before, yeah. I mean, we got a, a view of the baby. Right. So but, it's got to be But because of this century and because of what's going on and now the family thing, we feel like, and maybe, Will, you can shed some light on this or have a diff, different op opinion, but, you know, there's not a whole lot going on in this area as much as well, you mean a human be, activity? Human activity that used to be, and it wasn't even that prominent, you know, back before the pandemic. But I mean, people would go and you know hike or something like that. Yeah, but nobody going. No, there's nothing going on there. So um, you know, we 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 have a feeling that they are they are held or holded up somewhere out close close to where we. Um, you know, do this research. And the, I guess the, the reason we feel that way is because of this ramped up activity that, I mean, this is, this is not normal. Um, no, it's changed. And the, it's, changed, it's changed, you know, in, in that eight weeks that we've been going there um, with this, again, with the century and with this, now this, this potential family that might've been there the other night. Um, yeah. I'm seeing that in other areas currently also where they're moving in, where there's an absence of people activity. They seem to be filling in that gap. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Well, I agree. We feel like there's, you know, because of all this activity, and, and again, we've been doing this in this area for like 13 years, and there are many, many times that we have gone there and never had like a century around us. Or, um, yeah, quiet. you know, yeah. it would be random activity. You know, like that runner, no runner or that, that or thing. or those those tree knocks. You know, or we came in on the, a hunt. Yeah, or the the charge that we had. You know, this is like the, all random stuff that there there have been plenty of times we've gone there and absolutely you know. nothing. You all know, night. just crickets or you know, just dead silence. Yeah, the, um, cent but, the sentry is a clear indicator. There's a group there. Yeah, well, yeah, that's pretty. It's gotta be. There's pr that's pretty. Uh, obvious because you know this is not this is not normal for this area being so active like this and the century is is pretty um i don't know pretty i guess i would say docile <laughs> patient, pretty patient disciplined pretty you know <laughs> just, just hanging out and watching us or doing whatever you know throwing a stone here and there yeah. um last night was the first time that i think we've ever heard it pop and click um when it was there, that's the first time, and you can pretty much hear it. And two, I told Bob, what, two places. Yeah, I t yeah, two places. I'm thinking there's another one. There was another Could one. Could have been a century and somebody else, but two centuries. Um, but Bob, I was talking to Bob when I was listening to the recording from, you know, the night before, that I brought it. I brought it in for him to hear. I brought it over to him for him to hear a certain thing when the trees went down and the knock and everything before we left. And I said, you, you, you know, and I think I hear clicks and pops. And he said, yeah, I was hearing that too. So this is, again, this is something new. This is, they, they are, they like this area. And I, I really feel like that was a juvenile there. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't know what you think. Uh, Will listening to the whole, you know, story and Tom listening to the whole story. But it feels like it was, you know, a juvenile just planted there and said, look, stay there, you know, 
we're off foraging or we're off doing whatever. Or teaching, like they said. Or teaching, or yeah. Observations. Let me ask you a question. Um, it was near a small tree, correct? It was near, yeah, uh, the diameter of the tree was smaller, yes. Were there bigger trees nearby? Yeah. Yeah, there oh, yeah. were bigger trees, it was, but... It was out where that bluff charge was. So it, was it was on the same side as the bluff charge. It was probably Almost in the, the, same sa the same distance from where we were to that tree that... That's um, where you saw where the, we saw the eye shine. shine. Bluff? Yeah, bluff the bluff charge is where the tree directly across from... or a little diagonal across from where we were, we were parked, that's where the eye shine was when that we had that bluff charge. So from that bigger, you know, tree over about 50, 50 60 feet is where the other tree where the juvenile would have Small been hiding, one, yeah. hiding behind. Yeah. And it wasn't as big, you know. But the, the bluff charge tree was kind of like split in the middle. It's like a group. Yeah, it was like a group of trees. So, again, you couldn't, it was big enough to hide whatever was behind it, but bigger than, but you there know. There were definitely the, bigger trees around. Yeah, there, there are bigger trees around, yes. But this one was not, you know, not a very big tree. I don't even know how much, uh, probably maybe two, two feet in diameter, two and a half feet, three feet in diameter. It wasn't very big. Okay, I was just curious. Uh, it does sound like a learning experience for them. Yeah. Yeah. But they weren't yeah. too happy with us either. <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> learning experience well. for us. Never keep your your floodlight on the baby on a juvenile <laughs> when the parents are around. <laughs> that's that's a, that, that's what we learned. <laughs> And always take out your night vision and get it, yeah, on, get it on a record. Yeah. You know, it does take a lot of presence of mind to, to be prepared. And even then, you know, you may not react depending on the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we... We, we bring, like, strobe lights now. I, got, I bought an electric chainsaw with a 14-inch blade, so it smelt, doesn't smell gas. It's very powerful. And some in wedges, case the tree goes just down, in case you know. they try to, you know, put a couple of trees on the road on us. I'm, I'm still, I'm trying to be as ready as possible for everything, you know. But man, I should, I, I just, I could just kick, kick myself for not taking out that, that night vision. I, I'm, I'm gonna, that's gonna be with me for a long time. <laughs> it does, and you're right about it being a one-time um, opportunity. Oftentimes, when you're in the field and doing something like that, run across something. It, it could be a one-time event. So mm -hmm. that's that's something that I advise to people. If you're going to be out doing this, you know, try to be as prepared the best you can, of course. But yeah. right. but have the presence of mind to think, okay, all these different things could happen. And right. how, right. how am I going to be prepared for that? Oh, it was there. It was. <laughs> ah, but beyond that, it should <laughs> be in your hand. was there. <laughs> <laughs> It was in, we were semi-prepared. It was within our reach. <laughs> it, it took me years to actually get in the habit of having one of my cameras in, actually in my hand at all times, because I usually carry a couple of them. And well, uh, the last time, the yeah. last time we were, there, we had the century, you know, roaming around, and we first had the binocular. Um, it was in my lap, you know. This time I'm like, eh, you know, I'll get it if I need it. Yeah. Well, that didn't work so well. <laughs> well tom any any questions or folks do you have any questions or comments um you know i'm just kind of we were we were kind of hesitant about um you know bringing our uh, not really hesitant but we're wondering if you know when we brought our friends last night um you yeah, we don't want to drive them out yeah we were a little concerned about that although they weren't there and we thought that maybe they'd be you know, ready for us <laughs> last night and be a little perturbed at us Trees for, going down right know, off the for bat. everything that was going on the <laughs> night before, that they might retaliate, um, but, you know, they obviously didn't. They weren't even there, I don't believe. Sure. Um, they, they move around through their feeding areas. Yeah. That, you know, and I'm wondering if they come back um, again. You know, usually it's Bob and I uh, alone, and we, 
because we're in separate cars, the whole social distancing, you know, mm-hmm. thing. Not, me, not, not him and I. No, not Bob and I. <laughs> but yeah, you know. <laughs> And they're using they're using I love my wife but <laughs> they're using our you know our h2s we have h2s for each one of us so everybody can be hearing I'm the only one recording on mine we don't need to record every single one mm-hmm. um, but you know everybody is listening to the same thing and we have two ways and we you know we hear something and okay did you did you hear that that, that ping you know? Or they would call us and say, was that a rock, you know, or something like that. Um, but we were all hearing the same thing. And we would also ask them if we heard something, was that you? Did you make a movement? Because these these um, H2s can pick up pretty, you know, pretty easily little things that are going on. And Well, you were wondering your question about oh, yeah, bringing um, them there. Yeah, bringing them there you know, or bringing someone else there. I mean, we never know when that when that group is going to be out there. The century seems to be out there a lot, or has been out there a lot. This is the first time with the with the clan or the family there. Um, so, you know, do you think they'll come back? <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I think it's okay if you bring another vehicle there. In fact, if the whole group is there, you probably want to have a few more folks with you, a little bit larger group. Yeah. yeah, we're wondering when we're gonna, you know, get rolled one of these nights. Right? Yeah, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to become the ham sandwich. <laughs> we're pretty close the night we were before. We're not bringing mustard and mayo. I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna record that snap. And send it. You can hear that tree. That was pretty. That was a pretty, uh, you know, clear statement. I think you were making. Get your light off my kid. We've had enough. <laughs> you found him out. You know where he is. You know, stay where stay where you are. Leave or whatever. But that was that was pretty interesting. Do you feel like that's maybe what happened? I, I think so. It sounds like it. Yeah, it feels like it does too. Yeah, Norma. I want to comment. Um, it's it's always great to hear from you. That when we get an update, because you guys, both of you, have the most incredible um you know encounters and it's a it's a again you're right it's an escalation in activity and uh, in an area that you know that people might not think of you know massachusetts so um thank you very much it's uh, and i really especially the part with the juvenile that's pretty exciting very very interesting i, I you know i didn't even know if i could sleep Go yeah. back, you know, go to sleep it that morning. was morning. batting her eyes at Norma. <laughs> I was just so excited and blinking. I couldn't wait to tell you guys, you know, to, uh, oh man, you got to hear this. <laughs> oh, very you know? fascinating. This doesn't happen, you know, every day. And I don't know what's, if this clan has moved in, you know, to yeah, this we area. Don't know <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen from here on in. You know, there could be more, uh, you know, encounters and maybe even closer encounters. Could very um, well be. Yeah, with them. So, I mean, you know, we'll, well, I we'll guess keep we'll keep you see. updated. <laughs> when our when our car gets rolled and we, you know, <laughs> tell State Farm that this happens. <laughs> tell them it was Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we covered it. It's on the commercial. Yeah, we covered Picture it. Picture of a Bigfoot. We covered it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, listen, we're about out of time. Norma, yep. Bob, thank you. It's a pleasure as always. Uh, very, yes. very interesting update. Yeah, it's our pleasure, too. Thank Thank you so much. All right, everyone. We'll stay tuned for the third segment. We'll be right back after the break. Preliminary description of the external morphology of what appeared to be the fresh corpse of a hitherto unknown form of living hominid. This paper describes, in somewhat general terms, the results of a preliminary inspection of the corpse of what appeared to be some form of large primate of hominid form. The notion that it is a composite manufactured from parts of human corpses and or other animals must, of course, still be considered, 
since the body has not yet actually been examined. Should it be the artist who put it together, inserting several million hairs in the skin before it rotted or was preserved, would have to have had some concept to work from, and there is no such extent. This for the following reason. This body is not that of any hominid or pongid, and what is much more significant, it does not conform to any reconstruction or artist's conception of any fossil man or ape or other anthropoid. Its general features and particular characters, as detailed above, display an extraordinary mixture of what have until now been assigned either to men or apes, but it also shows others that have never been assigned or attributed to any of either. However, two separate companies specializing in model making for waxwork museums, exhibits, and film companies in Hollywood, California, have been traced, and individual model makers working for both have stated that they made copies with wax or latex and using hair from bears. Mr. Hansen, the caretaker, informed us in January of this year that such a model had been made in April of 1967 because the owner of the original was worried about its safety. An object such as this could possibly be constructed, starting with the skin of a large male pale-skinned chimpanzee, using a human skull, glove makers, wood racks for the hands, and so forth. The original could have been of this nature, and then a copy or copies made from it. Just in case this might not be the origin of the specimen, we should consider the alternative, namely, that it is a genuine corpse of a comparatively recently killed specimen, not fossilized in any way, of some form of parahominid. This is the considered opinion of Huvelmans and is based on as thorough an examination as he was able to make, considering that the specimen is encased in ice that is more than half opaque and sunk about two feet below the glass cover of its container. And, if this is the correct interpretation, we would opine that it would more probably be on the hominid rather than the pongid stem of anthropoid evolution. Just where it should be placed on that stem cannot, of course, be said until it has been properly examined out of its ice envelopment. Further, and much more important, will be any analysis of its blood, plasma, and other body fluids, if they are still sufficiently preserved for typing. Even then, we may well be confounded because this specimen displays such a combination of characters attributed to the two presently thought quite widely separated families of anthropoid primates, and this constrains us to add a note of added caution. In view of the fact that pongids and hominids have now been shown to fall into several groups, together, Vidi, the Caucasoid and Congoid hominids, with the gorillas and chimpanzees on the one hand, and the Mias, Siamangs, and Gibbons among the pongids with the mongoloid hominids on the other, is it not possible that not only the hominids, but the pongids have a grid-like genetic origin? If this be the case, could the concept not be further extended to include all the anthropoids, so that there may have been, and in this case may still be truly, man-like apes and ape-like men? This specimen is by several criteria a hominid, noticeably by its feet, but it has many pongid characters. Are the diagnostic features we are currently employing to separate the apes from men valid? If not, are both our families invalid, and could both groups form but one complex? If so, we will have to add the hairy man to Desmond Morris's naked ape. Anything of this nature will absolutely demand an overall revision of our ideas of both physical and social anthropology and will present a somewhat alarming problem to scientists and religionists alike. This author's personal opinion as to the precise identity of this specimen is, at the moment, not formulated. As a trained zoologist and one who spent many years collecting mammalian and particularly primate specimens for examination, dissection, and preservation in the field and while fresh, we would not presume to make any definite pronouncement upon anything other than a purely generalized overall description of its external appearance. The corpus must be freed from its ice encasement and properly examined first. However, some speculation as to the taxonomic status of this creature, if it finally proves to be real, is perhaps permissible, 
since we do have detailed measurements and photographs to back it up. It is Hovelman's opinion, which he states categorically in his paper, that this body represents the fresh remains of a Neanderthaloid human. Such hominids are currently classed as a subspecies of Homo sapiens, yet Hovelman's has named this item Homo pongoids, and thus of full specific rank. Though we suggested that appellation, pongoids, in the first place, we envisaged it either as a subspecific to Homo sapiens, since we have no idea as to the external morphology of the fossil Neanderthaloids, or merely as a possible specific for some other genus of anthropoid. However, this suggestion was purely tentative in that, despite the existence of this specimen, we have no more idea of its anatomy, histology, or physiology than we do of the external morphology of the Neanderthalers. I am therefore officially disassociating my name from that given in Hovelman's paper. We are constrained to do this not only because we are personally averse to naming any specimen before it has been physically obtained and properly examined, but also more precisely because we are not convinced that this specimen is Neanderthaloid or even a member of the genus Homo as presently constituted. Further still, it might not even be an anthropoid, but rather a survivor of a line divergent from, and possibly lying between, the hominid and the pongid branches, but derived from a common ancestor to all three. In the absence of the corpus itself, as of the time of writing, and in view of our total lack of knowledge of the external morphology of any anthropoids other than the living hominids and pongids, we consider it to be most incautious to attempt to identify this specimen as of now, and more especially to confine it within a subspecific title. And anent this, one essential feature of this specimen seems to have been overlooked. What can be seen of the conformation of the face, meaning the front of the head, in no way conforms to any known fossil hominid, apart from the juvenile Australopithecoids, and particularly to that of any Neanderthaler of comparable size. There is no prognosticism, virtually no brow ridges. The forehead does not slope acutely. The two teeth that can be seen are infantile. In fact, from what can be assessed of the anatomical structure of the fore part of the skull, this creature is almost as far removed from the standard Neanderthaloid construction as is possible. In these same respects, it shows no more affinity with Homo erectus, Homo habilis, what is known of same, or more especially, such lower types as were once called pithecanthropines, australopithecines, or such like. In fact, if it does prove to be a hominid, by whatever criteria may be decided upon to define that family when and if it is examined, it might well be called Homo pongoids, but it most certainly should not be assigned to the Neanderthal race or complex. Our final conclusion, therefore, is that the specimen we inspected was that of a genuine corpse as opposed to a composite or a construction, and that it is some form of primate. We would categorize it, as of now, as an anthropoid, but whether it is a hominid, a pongid, or a representative of some other previously unsuspected branch of that superfamily, we are not prepared either to say or even to speculate. There are certain firm indications that the specimen examined by Hovelmans and this writer, though it has been removed from the place where we saw it, and hidden while a substitute model has been installed, has not been destroyed and may therefore eventually become available for proper scientific examination. Until such time as this is achieved, we advise that it serve only as a pointer to the possible continued existence of at least one kind of fully-haired, ultra-primitive, anthropoid-like primate, and be used only as a lever to pry open the hitherto hidebound notion that any such thing is impossible. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs> <laughs>